All right, next on the list, everybody's favorite, the roundworms. These are the most worm-like, okay, of all of the, the parasites, transmitted by a number of different forms, and we'll talk about them as we talk about the specific diseases, but some of the common mechanisms of transmission are listed here. They don't have segmented bodies, as we just saw. These are actual round worms. And there's a few of them that I'm going to say, you know, are likely to show up on step one. And then the others we're really just going to mention and go through them and are actually fairly low yield for step one. All right. The first one, Anaerobius vermicularis, which is really, really important, in the U.S. is the most frequent roundworm infection. Okay. It is transmitted by ingesting the eggs typically, okay, and what happens are the eggs are going to mature and turn into adult worms in the intestine. What happens is the worms like to come out of the rectum at night. They'll lay their eggs and then they will actually go back up in the rectum. So what I'm showing in this image is the adult worms on the rectum. So they come out at night, they lay their eggs, they can actually get lost and find their way to the vagina in females, okay? This is very, very contagious, very, very common. You'll see this a lot of the time in school teachers, daycare workers, pediatricians, uh, a lot of um, careers that are associated with working closely with children. So the disease are pinworms, again, and it causes basically intense itching. So the vignette that you're going to see for uh, a pinworm infection is going to be that the mother brings in a child because he's somewhat irritable in the daytime, and that's because he's not sleeping well at night. He's got intense perianal itching because of the worms laying their eggs there at night, so he's not getting much sleep, okay? And also the intense itching. The mother's going to bring in the child and say, you know, he, he can't keep his fingers out of his backside. He's just constantly itching back there. And that's a big clue. Like if that kid were a dog, you ever seen a dog where they scoot their rear ends across the carpet just to try to itch? That's how itchy it is. All right. So diagnosis, how are we going to diagnose it? First of all, the eggs, which I'm showing here, are diagnostic. So we have kind of a flattened side, a curved side, and you can actually see the larva curled up inside of there. Now, diagnosis is by something called the scotch tape technique. So what happens in this case is, as a physician, you tell the patient, you know what, I, I think I know what this is, but you need to go home and at night while your child's asleep, you need to apply a piece of scotch tape across the rectum and bring it back to me. And what you're going to find on that piece of tape are either eggs, but you're actually pretty likely to find worms as well, because remember, the worms typically come out at night. You treat this with mebendazole, but you have to treat the entire family. Very, very contagious. You have to disinfect the entire house. Everything has to be washed in very, very hot, soapy water in order to not keep getting reinfected. So this is one of those nightmare diseases for families, kind of like head lice is. All right, next on our list is Trichurius trichuria, which is also known as whipworm. The worm itself, as I'm tracing here, resembles a whip, so that's where it got its name. How do you acquire this? By ingestion of eggs. And what happens very frequently with whipworm is you get rectal prolapse, like we're showing here. You can actually find the worms on the prolapsed rectum. So diagnosis uh, in that way is fairly easy if you have a prolapsed rectum. If you don't and you have other symptoms such as appendicitis, for example, you can look for the eggs in the feces. The eggs are considered diagnostic. They are unique. There's no other egg that looks like them. So the eggs, you can see an image. So here's the image of Trichurus. You've got a barrel-shaped or football-shaped egg 
with bipolar plugs, okay? So they can describe it like that or show you an image and you would have to know that this egg is specific for a whipworm or trichuris. And this is treated with albendazole. Do we have whipworm in the U.S.? Yes, we do. Um, it's not extremely common, but you can find cases of this in the U.S. So this is something that I wouldn't say super high yield, but you definitely want to have a handle on that one. All right, probably the most intense, clearly, of the roundworms is the Ascarid worm. Ascaris lumbricoides is the largest of the roundworm infections, and worldwide it is the most common helminth infection worldwide. Now, how are you going to acquire this? Again, we've talked about this before by ingestion of eggs. So you ingest the eggs and the larvae are going to migrate to the lungs and they're going to cause a little bit of pneumonitis in the lungs. So you get irritated, you <coughs> cough a little bit and swallow the larvae and then they mature in the small intestine. Now, what I'm showing here is a case of Ascaris where this patient was just treated for Ascaris, so a large bolus of worms came out. If you have Ascaris, you're not going to walk around with a trail of worms coming out your backside or anything, but this occurs during treatment when a large bolus of worms is going to be expelled. Now, you can clearly see how large these worms are, and they can definitely obstruct the intestine and or the bile duct. So that can, can seriously cause problems and it really depends on the worm burden, how many worms the patient has. A lot of the times these are diagnosed because someone uh, uses the restroom and notices a large round worm in there uh, and then of course goes to see the physician. We do have Ascaris in the U.S. It's associated with poor sanitation basically. Um, we don't see a lot of infections with it, but again, worldwide it's clinically significant, so it can show up um, on the USMLE. Now, as far as diagnosis, if you saw a worm like that, that's clearly diagnostic. Um, but the eggs as well are diagnostic. They're unique, and if you follow my pointer here, we can see that they're knobby around the edges, okay, and that is diagnostic and unique for Ascaris. You're going to treat with mebendazole and you can use supportive therapy for pneumonitis. I myself would need psychotherapy I think if I had an Ascarid infection but that's just me. Um, and for any ectopic migrations um, might require surgery for removal uh, of the organism. The next round one we're going to talk about is Toxocara canis or Toxocara cati. And obviously, depending on the animal that you acquire this from is uh, given the different species name. So if you acquire this from a puppy, we're talking about Toxocara canis. These are Ascarid worms that typically infect cats and dogs. But again, if we come in contact with these outside of its normal life cycle, we come in contact with them, the larva can't complete the life cycle, and as we see here, the larva wander around in the human host until they die and they cause intense inflammation as they're doing so. The disease is called visceral larva migraines because the larva are just migrating and migrating and migrating throughout the viscera causing intense inflammation. Um, so depending on the organ that the larva migrate to, you can have different symptoms. And a lot of the times Toxocara is diagnosed based on the history of handling puppies that have not yet been dewormed. So it's based on your history of pets. You can see the intense inflammation here. So you're surrounded by almost like what looks like a granuloma with a worm sitting in the middle or a larva. Okay. So we have to treat with mebendazole, but also surgery to remove these encased worms. So again, we have an Ascarid worm of a dog and cat, gets outside of its normal host, can't complete the life cycle, and wanders around aimlessly through the viscera. So we call it visceral larva migrans. 
The next of the round worms we're going to talk about is the hookworm, okay? Now there's two different species of hookworms. We have Nicator americanus, that's the New World hookworm, and we have Anslostoma duodenal, that's the Old World hookworm. In any case, the larvae penetrate the intact skin of your bare feet. So this is one you could actually get from walking barefoot on a beach. The larva can penetrate your intact skin. They actually migrate to the lungs, much like the Ascarid worms, cause pneumonitis. <clears throat> you cough up and swallow, and then the worm actually matures in the intestines. While it's in there, it does cause anemia because it does suck the blood while it's in the intestines. So that may be one of the presenting symptoms. Somebody presents, they're just tired. You find out from doing blood work, they're anemic. You do a stool sample and you find the eggs in the stool, okay? You will also typically find occult blood in the stool. And so treatment, you have to go at targeting the parasite, which is with the mebendazole and with iron therapy for the anemia. So here's our, our hookworm, okay? And that's hookworm for humans, where we are the definitive host. Anslostoma brasiliense and caninum are hookworms of dogs and cats, okay? And again, the larvae penetrate intact skin of typically uh, bare feet, but can't complete the life cycle. It wanted to be in a little puppy, but now it's in a human, and it doesn't know where to go. So what it does is it just migrates through the skin, makes tunnels as it goes. So we call this cutaneous larva migrans. So you can see in the images here, the worms or larva migrating through the skin. So one example on the top, here's another example on the bottom. You can also see there a little bit of pus causing here. You can see the erythema here, all right? So you're going to get intense itching. You can get secondary infections again from the itching. And the diagnosis is, is fairly simple, made based on, on clinical signs of the worm tunneling its way through the tissue. And you're going to treat this one with ivermectin. Now, Strongyloides stercoralis is called the threadworm. And the threadworm, again, the larva penetrates skin, uh, intact skin. And the disease itself is one of those uh, that can actually become more chronic. So if you are reading a vignette where, you know, somebody was maybe in, in Vietnam and now all of a sudden we're seeing these symptoms of maybe bloody stools, malabsorption, for example, you actually get chronic infection and reinfections with strongyloides because you can actually actually get auto infections. So you get these kind of indefinite infections if you're not treated. So if in the case they're mentioning somebody that's had this infection for a good long period of time, uh, you want to start thinking about the threadworm. How are you going to diagnose it? You're going to look for the larva, which I'm showing you here in the stool, and you can treat it with thiabendazole. Okay. The rest of the roundworms that we're going to talk about are fairly low yield, all right? But I'm going to make sure you know at least a few things about them because they randomly creep up on the boards every now and then, and you always want to be prepared for that, okay? So Trichinella spiralis actually used to be um, a pretty predominant pathogen in the U.S., um, and pork used to be the leading vector. Now that we know that trichinella has made its way into the, the pork, uh, we have better control over that, and we really don't see it very frequently in pork anymore. So now the number one means of transmission for trichinella is actually wild game. And probably the most highly associated is going to be bear. So if you're reading a question and you're like, bear hunting? What does bear hunting have to do with anything? They're trying to get you to think about trichinella, okay, because bears are loaded with trichinella spiralis. So what happens? You ingest that, that meat from the bear. The larva 
insist in your muscle and cause intense pain. So the disease is based on where the larva migrate and you're going to get myalgia, intense muscle pain, where the larva migrated. Now what's going to accompany that is fever. You can have periorbital swelling, as I'm showing up here. And you can also see splinter hemorrhages in the nail bed from Trichinella spiralis. So try not to get that confused. You can see that with other diseases as well, like endocarditis. But along with the intense myalgia, the history of hunting and cooking and eating wild game, uh, the splinter hemorrhages and the periorbital swelling, uh, those go along with Trichinella spiralis. How are we going to diagnose it? We're going to look by biopsy for the worm in the muscle. All right, so here's an example of one of those biopsies. How are you going to treat it? You're going to treat the infection with mebendazole and you're going to give steroids to control the inflammation. All right, next on the list is Wucheria bancrofti, which is the parasite that we all know and love that causes elephantiasis. Okay, this is actually transmitted by the mosquito. So the mosquito injects the juvenile into you when it feeds. And what we talked about for LGV, lymphogranuloma venereum, is essentially what's happening with elephantiasis. You are getting blocked flow of the lymphatics and massive lymphedema. And this is an example of elephantiasis in the extremities. But typically, we've all seen those pictures. I remember uh, the first picture I ever saw it was probably it was probably in National Geographic or something, where there was a, a male with elephantiasis carrying his scrotum in a wheelbarrow. Okay, so intense lymphedema is what we're talking about here. And you want to be able to link that back to the vector, which is the mosquito. Diagnosis clearly uh, can be clinical, but definitive diagnosis, you're actually going to find the filaria in the blood. And it requires an antiparasitic treatment as well as surgical reconstruction. Loa loa is the African eye worm and it's transmitted by biting flies. Now, as far as the disease, most of the time you wouldn't even know that you had loa loa. It does not cause blindness. So if you were to get a question on blindness and, and most of the organisms listed in the distractors were parasites, it's not loa loa. They can distract your vision because the time that you notice loa loa, as we see right here, is when they're crossing across the eye or actually the bridge of the nose, all right? So here's loa loa, not usually painful, but when it's migrating across the eye or the bridge of the nose is when you'll tend to notice it, all right? So diagnosis, typically clinical, when you see that worm migrating, and the treatment is diethylcarbamazine as far as the drug of choice for loa loa. Now what does cause blindness is Oncocerca volvulus. And Oncocerca is also called river blindness, okay? So the parasite that's associated with blindness is Oncocerca volvulus. It is transmitted by the black fly and it causes river blindness. What you see with Oncocerca is you'll get what are called these little nodules, okay? And if you clip these nodules, you can actually pull the worms out of those skin clippings, all right? So you look for the worms in the skin clippings of the nodules. So how are you going to treat this? It's going to be ivermectin to control the uh, infection and surgical removal of the nodules as we're showing here. All right, so that's Oncocerca river blindness. The last of the roundworms we're going to talk about, which is also my favorite, is Dracunculus medinensis. This is known as the guinea worm or the fiery serpent. You acquire this from the ingestion of water containing infected copepods. And the worms make it very easy on you as far as diagnosis because they cause an ulcerating skin lesion and then they just pop right out and say hello. Now this is the one that you've all read about and heard about where the treatment for this is that you had to take a stick or a pencil and wrap the worm around the stick 
and pull slightly until it didn't move anymore. Then you had to stop, okay? And every day you had to do that a little bit more and a little bit more until the entire worm came out. And the reason was because if you broke the worm, you risked anaphylaxis. Um, <clears throat> so what's unique about Dracunculus is the symbol for medicine, which is the serpent around that staff, is thought to have come from Dracunculus and the treatment for Dracunculus with wrapping that worm around that stick or pencil. So you have to remove the worm, that's part of treatment, and you can also use metronidazole for treatment. Okay, so remember as far as the parasites go, although we're finished here with chapter six, that in general they're fairly low yield, but hopefully you have a pretty good idea of what to expect on step one as far as the parasites.